Good afternoon to all of you. The topic for this afternoon will be about adolescence and uh, I really wanted to give this lecture supposedly synchronous online so I can interact with you. However, because of conflict in schedule, I have decided to record my lecture so as not to disrupt the schedule of your uh, classes in pediatrics. <clears throat> now, adolescent medicine is a very interesting field no? because if you are going to go into this specialty after you are done with your general pediatrics residency, you are going to deal with adolescents. And you know already that this is a very special age group, no? They are not children anymore, but they also are not yet adults. So I'd like you to take a few minutes individually and maybe think back, no? Around 10 years ago when you were still adolescents. So what were the events or at what time did you have the feeling you were not a child anymore? And what made you feel that you were like an adult already? So this is the coverage of my lecture for this afternoon. We will define what is adolescence, look at the stages of adolescence, and I am going to share with you the situation of the Filipino youth. What are the guidelines for an adolescent office visit? And what are the components of HEADS SF first interview? And a comprehensive adolescent interview. Then we will move on to sexual maturity ratings or the Tanner staging. Let's have a review on the events on puberty and how you conduct your physical examination as well as what are the different screening tests and what are the vaccines recommended for adolescents. So the word adolescence comes from adolescer, so meaning this is the time to grow up. And this is a time of immense biologic, psychologic, and social change. So if you recall in your pediatrics too on the lecture on adolescence, you have learned that there are different stages wherein in early adolescence, puberty no, is the highlight where there are physical changes that would occur in the body. Like in girls, the breast budding would start with later pubic hair development. And this is also the start of growth spurt. Now for boys, this will be enlargement of the testes and also at the same time, the start of genital growth. Now, psychologically, adolescents are concrete thinkers, meaning they would not really think beyond, no? or they don't know what would be the consequences of their actions at present. Like, for example, an adolescent who is asthmatic, no? an adolescent would usually complain if you are going to give them medications no, that they have to take every day. And if you are going to put an asthmatic adolescent on, let's say, an inhaler and he has to have it every day, when he is asymptomatic, he would not continue on using it because he would reason out that why should I be using my inhaler when I am okay at this time? And that is how a concrete thinker would, you know, reason out. But later on, 
they would develop into abstract thinking and this adolescent would realize that yes he is asymptomatic this time because he was taking the inhaler but if he stops it then he might have the signs and symptoms again of asthma now social aspect there's emotional separation from parents they really wanted no, to exert their independence already and there is a start of a strong peer identification and early exploratory behaviors like smoking also some violence now in mid adolescence biologically this is the time now that they have their menarche for girls there's development of the female body shape with fat deposition and for boys they would already have their sperm marker and nocturnal emissions psychologically now abstract thinking but self still seen as a bulletproof and socially they are still emotionally you know, separated from parents they have strong peer identification but at this time now there is really increase in the health risks like smoking alcohol engaging into unsafe sexual practices and early vocational plans then they move on to late adolescence so for boys this will be the end of the puberty and there is a continued increase in the muscle milk and the body hair and also this also will be the end also of puberty for girls so psychologically complex abstract thinking identification of difference between law and morality and socially developmental of social autonomy this is the time now that they are going to have some intimate relationships and the development of vocational capability and financial independence so you can just imagine no, that an adolescent has to go through these different stages. Now, what is special about adolescence? So, we have learned already that this is the time of rapid physical and psychological growth and development. No? And the hallmark, of course, is the start of puberty. This is also a time in which new capacities are developed, a time of changing social relationships, expectations, roles, and responsibilities. Now, let us try to look at terminology based on UNICEF and the WHO. And adolescence has been defined as the second decade of life. So that will be ages 10 to 19. And the youth, those between the ages of 15 and 24 years old, and young people, no, I'm sure most of you belong in this age, are those between 10 and 24 years of age. Now let us try to look at the Philippine adolescent population. In 2013, there's about 19.2 million youth in the Philippines already and 10.2 million belong to the age 15 to 19 years old and 9 million age 20 to 24 years old now let us look at Erickson's task of adolescence and one is emancipation no? which can be equated to being independent acquisition of identity and the sense of uniqueness or self-separateness intellectually an adolescent would ask himself or herself who am i in relation to the universe and sexually they would ask who am i as a sexual being now let us go back again and look at the stages of adolescent development so early adolescence would be referring 10 to 13 years old. And this particular stage, this adolescent now would really exert 
independence or autonomy. So sometimes they are very argumentative, they are disobedient, and they tend to challenge family and authority. So if you try to, you know, converse with parents who have adolescents, this will be the time that they will ask you, Dok, but parang nagre-rebel din na yung anak ko ngayon. No? Before, they would do and follow everything what I say. No? But at this time, they would question, no? why? No? Why should I have a curfew? Why should I do this? No? It's because this adolescent would really want to exert independence and also wanted to be treated like an adult already no? and not a child. Now, they are very moody. No? At one time, they are chattering. No? They are very talkative. And then suddenly, they would keep quiet or they will lock up themselves in their room. And they do daydreaming a lot. No? So, if you can recall when you were in high school, some of your classmates no? were caught by your teachers just staring in space no? during class hours. It's because they were maybe daydreaming about their crushes no or what they wanted to do or they they felt so bored no during the classes so they would try to reject now the things of childhood and displace the growing need for privacy so very important that when you have a parent of an adolescent patient you always remind them you know, respect your children and, you know, especially their privacy. Do not go inside the room no, without even knocking or telling them that you are going inside. Do not go over their things no, or even their cell phone. So I myself, no, as a parent of adolescents, and I have gone through that phase no, that my children would, you know, get angry at me if I would try to look at their post no in the, the social media and or look at their cell phones no and they would uh, always tell me that I'm a mom stalker no so maybe as parents we cannot really you know prevent from doing that but you have to set boundaries that your children would feel that they are respected okay body image is also very important at this time the early adolescent stage so they are very critical of and preoccupied with physical appearance and changes some may be anxious about wet dreams no? especially for boys masturbation for girls the size of their breast or the penile cells also In terms of uh, cognitive development during this early adolescence, the adolescent would always uh, focus on what is here and now. So that means that the adolescent would not try to think on what might or what can happen afterwards. So there is a need for instant gratification and there is a lack of impulse control. And this has been supported by a lot of scientific studies on the adolescent brain development that the adolescent would think using the amygdala, which we all know is the area for instant gratification for emotions. So that might be the reason why they're very emotional and also for impulses, aggression, and instinctive behavior. Now, the prefrontal cortex, which is the CEO of the brain, is the last one to develop. And remember that this area is the one in charge now of decision-making part of the child's uh, ability to plan and think about consequences of actions or control their impulses no, or solve problems. So... It is also in this age that, you know, they are trying to form their identity already. So they would ask the question always, who am I? And they would even ask sometimes, am I normal? Because the tendency is 
they would compare themselves with their other peers. And this is the time that there might be some emerging sexual feelings and exploration. And they would magnify their own problem and things that no one understands. So if you try to recall yourself before during this particular phase in your life, no, even a very simple or slight problem, you tend to magnify it no, and think that, oh, there's no more solution no, or there's, this is the end of the world already. So we need to understand that that is how an adolescent would think. So in terms of peer group, in early adolescence, the boys tend to go with boys also, no? and the girls would mingle with other girls. So there is a development of intense friendship, but with the same sex. And the contact with the opposite sex is in peer groups. So if you have you know, a friend no? who belongs to a, a group of boys, then that's the time when you have... Uh, can be bef can befriend them or you can meet them. In terms of vocation, there is a reset of priorities for social life than study, and they may have unrealistic academic goals and frequently changes them. So still very important that as parents, no, we teach the parents to tell them that. Remember that your adolescents or your teenagers are not yet adults. So you really have to sit down with them to guide them and nurture them. Now we move on to middle adolescence, which is between 14 to 17 years old. And this time, they would exert also autonomy. They would show ambivalence on emerging independence, which may lead to family conflicts. So they would ask rules no that would be set at home policies at home no they would try to uh, test their parents no so as parents we also advise them no that you should communicate well no and check on your adolescent always at this time so that things will be clear with you and there will be a good communication line between the parent and the adolescent how about body image now, this is the time when there is increased interest in making the body image more attractive and excessive physical activity alternating with lethargy. In cognitive development, there is now the emergence of formal operations that lead to effective planning. So you can say that or observe that they are more mature no, in this particular phase in their lives and they can understand better the consequences of behavior but there is still a feeling of omnipotence and immortality and this is a very important aspect to understand no because if you are dealing with teenagers with chronic medical illnesses you always have to make them understand that even if they are still young if they are not going to take their medications then there might be some problems that will be detrimental to their health, no? or it's possible that they will die also. Identity development is also in this uh, stage already. They would try to experiment on drugs, alcohol, sex, and there is increased intellectual ability and creativity. Now, how about the peer group? There is now formation of strong peer allegiances. But what we have to watch out for is that they are very susceptible to peer pressure. So this is the time when they go out with their friends. No? And even if you trust your adolescent son or daughter, but if the influence no, of the friends uh, is stronger, then they might do something that they're supposed not to do that they know is not right. No? So there is really a w wisdom no, in the saying that you have to know the friends also of your children, no? so you can know if you can trust them or you cannot trust them. So they are into fad behavior. There is emerging sexual drives which lead to exploration and ability to attract a partner. In terms of vocation, 
they are able to set more realistic academic or vocational goals and begins to realize strength and limitation. Now let's move to late adolescence, which is 18 to 21 years old. So in terms of autonomy now, no, they are college students, some of them might be studying uh, far away from home, so they are very independent, no, or some might be working already, and they would adopt an adult lifestyle. In terms of body image, they would be comfortable already no, with their body image. Cognitive-wise, there is emergence of your abstract reasoning. They are able to compromise as they are able to engage with their conscience and can delay their gratification. In terms of identity development, they would relate to family as adults. So this is the time that they would reintegrate into the family and would try to spend more time with them uh, compared to early and middle adolescence where they would like to spend more with their friends. So establish ethical and moral value system, realizes their own limitations and mortality and establish sexual identity. And this time they are more capable of intimate relationships. Among peer group, they make decisions and maintains the values as they are less influenced now by their peers, no? Because they are more confident with, you know, their identity, they know who they are, they know what they want, no? So they can decide for their own already and they are not, you know, influenced by FAD or their peers. They relax to individuals more than peer groups selects partner based on individual preference. Now in vocation, they would now pursue the realistic academic vocational goals with training and actual employment. Now I will be moving on to another topic which will be about the Filipino youth. No? I think it's very important that you should know the Filipino adolescents and there was a study which was done, the Young and Adult Fertility Study, wherein it has been done for several years, no? And it used a 10 instrumental survey instruments in different regions in the Philippines. And the sample size per region were around 1,000 respondents. So there were approximately a total sample size of 17,000. So when we look at the educational profile of the Region 11 youth, so 37.8 no, are high school undergraduate and 23.1% are high school graduate. Only 16.4% are college students. And take note, no, there's 16.1% no schooling. So that would mean this portion of percentage of our youth are just there in their houses no, or in their communities and we don't know what they are doing. <clears throat> and the 6.5% are into vocational courses. So the educational profile of Region 11 youth would say that college and higher education is below the national average. And the proportion of the Region 11 youth who are studying in the Region 11 is the fourth lowest in the country. In terms of youth employment, one of four Region 11 youth is working. So this is the second biggest proportion of unemployed youth. And one in 10 youth in Region 11 is idle. So that is about 9 to 7 percent. Now we know already that in this particular stage of their life, no, if they are doing nothing, they are just idle, they are not in school, they are not even working. So the risk of them not to involve in some activities that might be detrimental to them would be high or the risk factor that they would do risk-taking behavior activities. In terms of marital status, 76% never married, 16.3% are living in already, 
and 6.1% are formally married. Now let us look at how the Region 11 youth are digitally wired. So 74.9% no, own a cellular phone. But if we are trying to look at figures, you might say that oh, this is low because you can see no, even not an adolescent, even a school-aged child would own a cell phone already. Watch the TV regularly, that's 65.2%. Use the internet, that's 56.7%. They have an email account of 50.7% and have a social networking account of 50.3%. Now, 36.5% of them have text mates that they have not met in person or they have an online friend or online friends that they have not met in person 33.6 percent and this is a bit alarming no because even if they don't know that person they would accept it in their uh in social media no maybe in facebook or whatever platform they're using and uh since uh, I also work at the Women and Children Protection Unit, no, which where we take care of abused women and children, in our statistics, we do have a lot of teenagers who are abused, no, especially sexually abused, and in our statistics, there are no a lot who would meet with these uh, friends, no, who were their text mates or who were their online friends, no. So there is really danger for this. And some of them, 2% of personal blog, but I'm sure the figure now is higher, no? especially during the pandemic. No? Most, uh, a lot of people, not even celebrities, no? have their own personal blogs already. Now, two in five in Region 11 youth exercise at least two to three times a week. No? So you can see that there are only few no, who are you know, active in terms of physical activity. And a lot, the biggest proportion of youth who consume instant noodles. No? And you know that these are just carbohydrates and even there's high salt no, in this particular food. And they are the second highest proportion of youth who drink carbonated drinks. So let us look at now the non-sexual behavior. Proportion who are currently smoking is below the national average. I think this is a positive note, no? Because maybe of the ordinance in our city where there's anti-smoking, and maybe this has also improved no, to lower the statistics. Proportion who are drinking is also below the national average. Proportion whoever use drug is decreasing, but for those who use drugs has the highest number. So this is uh, quite worrisome. No? So if you look at the data on the use of drugs, no, you know that Region 11 is there in the top 10. Now, looking at non-sexual behavior, the third biggest proportion of youth who ever thought of committing suicide no, comes from our region. And three in a hundred attempted suicide. So that means that we really need to take care no, of the mental health of our youth. Now, violence. Proportion of Region 11 youth who have been aggressors of violence is above the national level. And the second biggest of youth who have experienced harassment using technology. So in the survey, they were asked on the sources of information. And three in five Region 11 youth do not have any source of information about sex. So they got it from TV, internet, books, movies, videos, and magazines. And they said that they would prefer the sources of information about sex and reproduction from friends of the same sex, medical professions, mother, teachers, sister. So only 1 in 20 in Region 11 youth has discussed sex at home while growing up. We know already that in our culture, no, talking about sex is a taboo at home. 
but we have uh, in our parenting sessions no we always tell the parents that you should always have an open mind no in trying how to to discuss about sex in a good context no and not in the you know other sources of information where they can get like from pornographic materials so in terms of sexual behavior one in five in region 11 youth has shared sex videos online and through cell phones and 0.9 percent recorded themselves having sex 4.4 engage in sex with someone they met online through text messages and 8.1 percent have engaged in phone sex so earlier i mentioned to you already that at the women and children protection unit we do have a lot of teenagers no, who were sexually abused by their text mates no, or their, uh, their acquaintances or uh, friends online no? uh, when they would first, uh, for the first time, they call it uh, eyeballing each other. Now, two in five youth in Region 11 have sexual experience premarital sex and the mean age of the first sexual encounter for males is 17.2 whereas for females is 17.4 and 8 in 10 were unprotected sex so there is therefore having uh, sexually transmitted infections HIV or even uh, unplanned pregnancy is very high and risky sexual behavior, 6.3% have engaged in casual sex, 4% in FUBU experience, and 6.4 males have had sex with a fellow male. Now looking at the teenage fertility, we are number 5 in teenage fertility prevalence, and most risky sexual activities are unprotected against the risk of pregnancy and STI. So, you, you are going to, it's important for you no, to have an idea on what is going on among our teenagers in the region. So that when you are going to do your medical interview now with an adolescent patient, you know what are the important questions that you need to ask in terms of personal and psychosocial history. So we are moving now on the topic of interviewing and communicating with adolescents. Now, I would be sharing with you the video. No? I would post it also in iLearn on how the adolescent uh, consultation should be done no? with a parent. And uh, you would see that it's uh, an entirely different uh, method no, compared to the usual consultation that we have. So the impact of communication in healthcare. I just wanted to re-emphasize again how important communication skills no, in medicine. So extensive research have shown that no matter how knowledgeable a clinician might be, if he or she is not able to open good communication with the patient and his or her family, he or she may be of no help. So you are aware already no, about effective communication. So it's not just being nice, but produces more effective consultation for both patient and health professionals. So remember, it would improve accuracy, efficiency, supportiveness, the health outcomes of patients, the satisfaction for both patients and health professionals, and what is important is, of course, your therapeutic relationship between the patient and the doctor. So you all know this already, no? I hope you still remember what was taught to you during your first year in the Arts and Science of Medicine 1. So communication skills need to be taught and learned, content skills, no? what you say. So how are you going to ask questions? How are you going to give advices to your patient? Process skills, how you say it. Perceptual skills, what you are thinking and feeling. Now, how about communicating with adolescents? So these are the do's. No? You go through the chart, referral note, before seeing the patient. 
it's important that you have an idea already on what could be the reason why the patient was referred to you. And then you go to the waiting room, get your patient, no? introduce yourself by hand. You know this already. No? At now, of course, we don't shake hands during the pandemic. And in the office, you present yourself and what you do. Now, very important is always to assure confidentiality and define the meaning of words. Let the patient tell his or her story without interruptions as much as possible. Ask the open-ended questions no, in a non-threatening way. Have a conversation. Questions from general to more intimate topics. Have a professional attitude and always in a non-judgmental manner. Now, what are the don'ts? No? In my experience at the uh, teen center, no? the adolescents you know, don't like if you are taking down notes when they are talking or you are getting your, uh, doing your interview with them. They are suspecting, no? they are very suspicious that you know, you are writing all the information and you might share that information with your parents or other persons. So when you need to write down, you always uh, explain to them and tell them what is that. So transmitting information to the network without permission no, is a no-no. Don't use medical jargon, then yes and no questions, doing an inquiry, threatening or telling patient what to do. Trying to be a friend, adolescents, no, are looking to you as a professional and not a peer. But whenever the adolescent will disclose something to you, very sensitive, no, information, you know, do not be, do not be very emotional or you interact with it, no. They don't want you to be judgmental of what they have been doing. So when they are with the parents, you do your history taking, general questions first. Now do not try to get very uh, uh, intimate questions or uh, things, questions that would put your uh, adolescent in a hot seat. No? Then ensure confidentiality. And then you go through the program, how do we work no? and who is the patient. Uh, Often than times, you need to understand who has the problem. Is it the patient, the adolescent, or is it actually the parent no, who is uh, a warrior, no, very overprotective and very anxious of the adolescent. Now, when you are with the adolescent alone, so you have to know what was the reason for the consultation. Again, ensure your confidentiality. And then use your screening tools. No? We have the acronym, the HELS SSF, and them systems review. Always check their sleeping, eating habits, do your PE, and the conclusion on what to tell the parents. So this slide now will be about the guidelines for confidentiality. Now, we always discuss with the parent and the child about confidentiality especially with a teenager when they are already being interviewed alone. And the only time that you can break the confidentiality is, one, when your adolescent patient, you know, has suicidal tendencies or there is an impending harm to the patient or to any other person. Second, if the patient is a victim of any form of violence, it can be physical violence, sexual, emotional, psychological, or bullying. And reaffirm confidentiality when alone with the adolescent. Now, the next slides that I'm going to show you, will go, we will go a run through no, on what goes on in the HELS SF interview, which is an intensive psychosocial questions no, for your adolescent. So home, so these are the questions you can ask, no? Where is the teen living? Who lives with the teen? How is the teen getting along with parents and siblings? Because you wanted to know what is the dynamics of the family? What is happening at home, no? You might realize that uh, the adolescent is having some emotional or mental problems. It's because of uh, stress, no? Or the conditions at home. Education, so you want to know if this adolescent is in school, what are 
his or her favorite subjects how is he or she doing and if the teen is out of school you can ask about employment so you also ask about activities no so after school what does the teenager do no some teens are engaged in sports activities some might have uh, extra uh, academic activities what does the teen do to have fun and with whom does the teen participate in any church or community activities no and what are the teen's hobbies now you always have to screen for abuse so it can either be sexual or physical abuse so how are you going to phrase your questions so you can ask no if she has a group of friends she has a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then your follow-up question will be has somebody been hurting you physically or emotionally no? or somebody might be forcing you to do things that he or she does not like or doing something to her his body that he or she is not comfortable now in our experience when you are going to use the screening questions you are going to really pick up some cases of patients no who haven't disclosed to anybody that they were victims of violence so this is another screening questions for violence no and the acronym is hits so these are the questions that you can ask especially for those who have partners like boyfriends girlfriends no or even for some who are living in already hurt you physically insult or talk down to you threaten you with physical harm scream or curse at you so any yes answer not to that question is already a red flag and you have to process it so, or you have to refer the patient not to to somebody who can do some counseling so don't just disregard it we also ask questions about drugs no so you want to know if the friends of this adolescent no are into drugs or what type of drugs are they using at the same time you also use tobacco use no or have they ever tried smoking you will learn that some are doing it only for experimentation no and they won't do it again so how do we approach to the sensitive questions of course you cannot ask directly no do you take drugs they would definitely answer you no no even if they have been experimenting on it so the way to do it is to rephrase your question in a less invasive manner like for example i know that drugs are fairly common on school campuses what drugs are common on your campus and then the teenager will tell you oh you know i know some friends are using marijuana no it is not uncommon for some teens to try some of these drugs have any of your of you tried it no or your friends how do you handle when your friends are using drugs do you ever try so with these questions aside from knowing the information if they are using some drugs you are also trying to know how this adolescent responds to peer pressure okay now diet no do not forget to ask about diet so check the weight of your patient is your patient overweight or your patient is underweight no or obese already so check also the eating habits of the adolescent uh we know already especially for girls no weight is really a very big issue for them so they would worry about their weight and they try dieting and uh some would be you know very unhealthy no that um you need to sit down with them no and discuss to them the importance of eating the proper food safety issues also no you always have to ask them when they are driving or when they are in the car are they using seat belts when they are driving motorcycles bicycles are they using helmets and sports safety measures hazardous activities or drinking while intoxicated now the last one is very important no because we do have a lot of the teenagers 
who are involved in vehicular accidents because the driver had taken some alcohol. Then another very sensitive topic will be sexuality. So you have to ask, is the teen dating? What are the degree and types of sexual experience? Is the teen involved with another individual in a sexual relationship? Now, do not always have the impression that if you're talking to a male adolescent, the partner is a female, no? Or if it's a female, it's a male, no? You have to be very sure. So you can politely ask, no? Is your partner, let's say, a male or a female? And they will tell you, no? They are very open about that. So the approach is, are you going out with anyone right now? As you know, there are many teens who are sexually active. And there are also many teens who have chosen not to have sexual relationship. How have you handled this part of your relationship? Okay. Another area will be the mental health of our teenagers. So very important that we have to check on them, no? especially during this pandemic. There's an increase in the numbers no? of our adolescents who are uh, having depression. No? Sino ba naman ang hindi ma-depress, di ba? It's almost two years now that they are there in their homes. Supposedly, this would be the best times of their lives, no? Can you imagine those who are in senior high, no? It's only two years, no? They started their first year in senior high online. Now they are also online, and until they graduate, they'll be online. They haven't even met their classmates, no? Uh, face to face and even their teachers so that's a very uh, depressing uh, experience right so you have to ask no does the teen have any current suicidal ideation or were their prior suicide attempts no so when you are also talking to the teenager you have to be very observant no some may say no but then you can see on the wrist there are some scars, no? So that will sus make you suspect that there might be some suicide attempts, no? Before. And have you ever felt so bad that you wanted to kill yourself? So do not forget this uh, area, no? Because this is very important. And then you can ask them about family and friends. We need to know who is supporting the adolescent, no? Uh, sometimes you would realize the toxic ones no, are the parents or maybe the siblings. No? So these are the stresses that can be present at home. And remember that the home is supposedly a haven no, where you know, everybody would feel loved and accepted. But if there are some you know, difficult things or uh, experiences that's happening at home, then you have to help this adolescent. Okay, image. So I have mentioned this already. Height and weight perceptions, body musculature, physique and appearance. And of course, recreation. No. So what are the other activities no, of these adolescents? And they said it's really very important to check on spirituality and connectedness. So as if this adolescent no has uh, been going to church or what are the personal spirituality and practices uh, the importance of this is they said that those who have good foundation no in terms of spirituality are the ones no who can cope up uh, whenever they are depressed or maybe they have a lot of uh, issues or problems that they are facing at this particular age now, after doing your HEADS SF interview, you have to assess the degree of risk. So, no risk if they are not engaged in any of the risk behavior. The family, school, social functioning are stable, positive, and presence of a number of protective factors. Low risk when they would engage in safe experimentation. Risk-taking is sporadic, recreational, experimental, protective factors outweigh risk behavior. Like, for example, the adolescent disclosed to you, uh, you know, doctor, I try smoking, no? Because my friends, uh, you know, pressured me to try it also. So what happened, you asked? 
and uh, the adolescent tell you oh, i don't like it no because i don't like the smell i don't like uh, the taste of it so i stop it so you know that this uh, adolescent only wants to experiment on smoking moderate risk they are engaged in behaviors with harmful consequences such as impairment of positive functioning and developmental tasks the presence of social environmental risk factors family problems peer group influences and other risk factors no? the presence of protective factors so sometimes they will tell you that oh there was time when i had two bottles of beer and i was the driver no so you know that uh you would tell them that do you know that that's very risky not only for you no but as well as your friends who were the passengers in that particular car no then high risk if there is really major disruption or risk to health safety or life persistent or escalating harmful behaviors persistent or negative consequences the presence of major risk factors and few protective factors so this is the end of the first part of the lecture so you can just save your questions and when we are going to have an online uh, session then you can ask the questions so i am moving now on the second part of the lecture which deals more on physical examination so you have learned already in second year that puberty no, is the time when there are a lot of physical changes especially the appearance of the secondary sexual characteristics in the body so each adolescent will pass through this phase no differently some may have passed through this phase smoothly others would have a lot of embarrassing experiences no or very feeling very awkward at the time and uh, so you have to understand on what's going on okay so this slide would show us that the hypothalamus is the one that releases our gonadotrophin releasing hormones no and they stimulate the pituitary to produce your fh lsh and then the gonarche so we have the hormonal hormones now testosterone estrogen which are the secondary sexual characteristics responsible for that and then we also have the growth hormone which is uh, responsible for growth spurt in your adrenals no we have your adrenocorticotrophic hormones which is responsible for adrenarche so the exact trigger is actually unknown but what they have uh, noticed is that there is a decrease in the sensitivity of hypothalamus to estrogen and testosterone that's why it leads to increased levels of your lh and fsh and there is augmentation of the pulsatile lh secretion during sleep so among males the luteinizing hormone can stimulate the Leydig cells in the testes to produce testosterone and the fsh stimulates the sertoli cells in testes to produce the sperm later in puberty how about the females the luteinizing hormone stimulates the thicker cells in the ovary to produce the androgens and the fsh stimulate follicular cells in the ovary no so this is in preparation for ovulation then in females positive feedback cycle develops so the increased estrogen can cause the burst of your gonadotropic hormone releasing hormone which causes your lh surge so in the adrenals no we have uh, androgens and they are the one causing the adrenarche it has been noted also that insulin secretion increases no 30 percent during puberty and also the growth hormone and your somatomedin c levels also rise during puberty now in our physical examination it's expected 
then you have to do your tanner staging or what you referred as the sexual maturity ratings no? so you are familiar with this no so in females we look at the breast development from stage tanner stage one to tanner stage five and for also the distribution of the pubic hair so these are the five stages of the breast development in females no we have prepubertal so this is your smr1 now breast budding appears at smr2 and smr3 you have already enlargement of the breast protrusion of the papilla but there's still no contour separation SMR4 is enlargement of the breast and the protrusion of the areola and papilla and you have there your secondary mount or dairy. An SMR5 is an adult breast already. In terms of the pubic hair distribution, under stage 1, you don't see any of the pubic hair. SMR2, there is sparse, lightly pigmented, straight at the medial border of the labia and then smr3 darker beginning to curl increase amount smr4 coarsely curly abundant but less than an adult and in the smr5 you can see the adult feminine triangle and the pubic hair spreads to the medial part of the thigh now look at this slide no? so this can explain all the physical changes that happens during uh, puberty in a female so females usually height increases first no and then you can have your breast development and then during breast tanner stage four and five no you can have your menarche already and then also you have uh, pubic hair distribution between tanner stage 4 and 5 also. So puberty begins with breast budding in girls. So that is the first physical change that happens. Now what is the sequence? No? Thalarchy first, meaning the breast development. Adrenarche, that's the appearance of their pubic hair. Peak height velocity. You have continued breast and hair development, menarche, and completion of puberty. So the peak height velocity occurs about one year after breast budding. So if you would recall, during elementary, you know, grade 5 and grade 6, suddenly you can see your female classmates then that they were increasing in their height already. Boys will do it later. You no, know, there's a lag mostly in high school already and the menarche no, can happen 1.1 years after the peak height velocity or two to three years after the breast budding so when you have a child no, whose breast budding started at around eight years old then you can expect at 10 to 11 this particular child will have her menarche already the average age of the NARC is 12 years and occurring at SMR 3 or 4. No? But in some uh, documentations or in some references, no, you can see that it is between SMR 4 and 5. And the normal range of the NARC is 9 to 17 years old. So if the child had her menstruation no, so early at around 8 you have to investigate no what's happening and if also the menstruation happened very late already you also have to investigate on what is happening to your patient how about in males so these are the tanner stages in males no so you also have the increase in the size of the testicles and also in increase in the length of the penis and also the distribution of the pubic hair so smr1 is pre-adolescent smr2 you have their enlarged scrotum already minimal enlargement of the penis you have scanty long slightly pigmented pubic hair 
SMR3 diaper starting to curl the penis lengthen larger testes. SMR4 first curly glance and breath increase in size larger scrotum. SMR5 is adult distribution so does spread to the medial surface of the thighs adult size. So looking at the physical development no, for boys, no, you can see that the first change that happens is the increase in their size of the testicles. No? Then they also have their height spurt, then genital size increases, and also the appearance of the pubic hair. So look at this slide if you are going to compare now from the girls to the boys. Look at the height spurt. No? It's uh, early for the girls as compared to the boys. So complete sexual maturity for boys is between 17 to 18 years old. So this is the sequence of pubertal events, testicular enlargement, adrenarche or appearance of the pubic hair, continued testicular penile enlargement, peak height velocity, and peak weight velocity. Ejaculation occurs at SMR3, voice changes occurs at SMR3 and 4, and fertility is established at SMR4. Now, when we do our physical examination, always remember to ensure the patient's comfort and address the patient's concern. No? And a reminder to everybody, no, for male doctors, make sure that there is always a female uh, person present, no? be the mother or the guardian, the nurse, your secretary, no? or another female doctor. Ensure privacy and confidentiality. Avail of opportunity to ask about bodily concerns. Consider who should be present during the physical examination. Now, we check for, of course, no? blood pressure. We calculate the BMI of our patient check the vision, hearing screening, skin examination, teeth and gums, neck exam for acromegaly or adenopathy, cardiopulmonary, abdominal, and genitals. So include also your musculoskeletal PE, sexual maturity ratings, breast examination for the girls, scrotum examination for the boys, and gynecologic examination for the girls who are sexually active. Now, what are the different screening tests no, for adolescents? You test for hemoglobin hematocrit, especially for females who have a history of profuse menstrual bleeding. No? A lot of them will be anemic. So we need to document that so that we can also correct their anemia. You can do your urinalysis, your TB screening with PPD, visual screening, hearing screening, and for those who have high risk, no? family members who have a cardiovascular event at the age of 50 years old or 55 years old, so you have to check the cholesterol, or there is a family history of hypercholesterolemia. So when you do your PE, no? focus on the skin. Uh, take note no? of uh, tattoos and ask them where they had that, no? Uh, a lot of them will just, you know, have their tattoos there in the corner or whatever, no? That sometimes they might get infected with hepatitis B, no? I have one patient before uh, who had, uh, was hep B surface antigen positive and uh, he wa she was actually asymptomatic, no? And uh, there were no other members in the family with a history of hep B but in her history, she said that she had a tattoo no, in Boracay before. So most probably, no, that was done uh, not in a very safe or a sterile manner that, you know, uh, it could be a reason why she contracted hepatitis B. A and body piercing, no? So check on this, uh, uh, where they did it, no? So... There might be some infection that could develop, or what was it done in a serial manner also, no? So you have to uh, check on these things. Now, in the skin also, 
very common no that they have acne and that is uh very stressful for them no they they would their self confidence no usually goes down uh because you know body image is very important for them so you can see teenagers who have a lot of pimples on the face no they won't look at you in the eye or they would always look down because they are very conscious so we also tell the parents no na wag na yung attitude na sinasabi lang na ayaan mo lang yan pimple lang yan that's part of adolescence but maybe not for that adolescent who is uh, you know very conscious so we tell them that oh you can seek consultation and ask uh, help from the derma no to help you uh, control no the acne and what management uh, can be given for that you also screen for scoliosis no so you can ask your patient to do the forward bending test and try to see no like in this picture you know that the scapula no is not aligned with each other no it's very obvious that this patient has scoliosis so you have to have a an x-ray so that the radiologist radiologist can compute no for the angle of the scoliosis and you can refer this to an orthopedic surgeon so special circumstances recommendation so sexually active no they have to have their pap smear yearly and then should be screened for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, uh, alcohol and drug use, no drug alcohol levels, hepatitis, AIDS, and uh, those uh, male adolescents having sex with male adolescents, you have to screen them for uh, STI, hepatitis, and HIV also, and always ask for the immunization for adolescents, like they have the TD booster, no? So the small D there would be lower amounts of your diphtheria. And you have your toxoid, your MMR, hepatitis A and B, you have your varicella, and you have your human papilloma virus vaccine, no? And of course, no, at present, uh, of course, the only those who are 18 and above in the Philippines are given the uh COVID vaccine, no, not yet for younger, but we hope that uh, soon, no, it will be approved that it can be given already to younger ones. But we all know that it's only the Pfizer vaccine right now who has been given to uh, young adolescents. Okay, so I will be ending now the first part of the lecture. And uh, the second part of the lecture will be next week, no? So hopefully, I would be able to see you already online, no? We'll have a synchronous activity. And if ever you're going to have any uh, questions, then you can post the questions when we will see each other online. Thank you and have a nice afternoon and continue to stay safe.